consciousness, I hear the conversation that's taking place, and I, essentially what I hear is, why are the windows fogging up? Um, this is kind of in the summer-ish months, and she, the driver tells the shotgunner, like, what's that sign say? And they wipe off the window, and they read the sign, and it says, 30 miles to Canada. So to give a little more context to this, like what happened, right? Like what went wrong? So back then, 20 years ago, we didn't have all the great fancy GPS tools that we have now and the phones and the directions. And we use a thing called an atlas to get around everywhere and to book out all of our trips. Has anybody actually ever used an atlas? Or there's a few people here? Yeah, so a few people actually use this archaic written form to figure out how you get from one point to another. Uh, and the person who was shotgunning had never used an atlas before, never knew how to read a map. So the driver had taken the time to say, well, I'll teach you how to read a map while we're traveling. So she was so focused on training this person how to read a map that she didn't pay attention that when she got, when we stopped off at the gas station and she got back on, she headed right back in the direction that we came from, uh, I think 95, I-95, heading us right back up towards Canada. Um, the, ob the, the moral of the story is, if you're not focused on the right thing, you'll end up at the wrong place, right? If you don't focus on the things that are the most important at that stage, at that very moment of what you're doing, you're going to end up at the wrong place. So what I want to talk about today is how do we get to one million in revenue and selling a WordPress product that may be a service. And before we can talk about getting to one million, we have to know what our different stop-off points, what our different destinations are, and we have to talk about our first destination, which, how do we just get to 10,000? Like, forget anything else. How do we make 10,000? And for us, this is a story of, of our journey as selling a product, uh, add-ons like Ninja Forms and add-ons for that. And so for us, that was our first 400 customers. How do we get to $10,000? What are the challenges and the things that we had to deal with? The very first thing I think you have to deal with, right, is building something worth selling. And there's a lot of advice out there for how to do that. Some of them is, hey, scratch your own itch, right? You've, you've got something going on, a problem you want to solve. Maybe you're doing freelance work and you're wanting to get into the product space. And so what you decide to do is, I'm going to solve this problem and see if I can sell this to other people. And that's a great way of doing it. Another thing that you can do to kind of pick something to build is build for an established brand. There are whole companies that are built on top of another plugin that's already successful. My friend Zach Katz uh, has a great product, Gravity View, built on top of Gravity Forms, right? Gravity Forms is an established, popular brand. People know it, people are using it, and he's solving a problem that Gravity Forms itself doesn't solve. How do I display that, submission, that submitted data, those entries, on the website? So that's a great way you can establish a, yourself in a business to a product that already people want. You can also do this by attaching yourself to uh, maybe an add-on plugin. So Ninja Forms, easy digital downloads for a long time, WooCommerce. They had marketplaces as set up where you could build little pieces of functionality and sell on their store. So we do it, EDD does it. I think WooCommerce has closed the doors as far as accepting new developers for that. But that's a great way where you don't have to spend the time working on how do I build an e-commerce store, how do I manage this, all the administration costs of that, all the software, all the plugins, all the security. You don't have to deal with any of that. You just build your product. They'll sell it, you'll make money, and you get to kind of get your feet wet in this. And this is one way we can do it. Now, the most, I think the best way you can do this, and this may fly against what other people might say in our community at times, is find out what's already selling. So when we came into the market, right, we had a big competitor, Gravity Forms. They're huge. They were the big dog. Everybody knows who they are. Probably everybody have at least... All right, how many people use Gravity Forms in this room, right? All right, so we had competition. So when we came into the space, we knew Forms sold. People were buying Form products. We didn't have to guess at that. We knew it. What we had to figure out is, can we solve a problem they're not solving? Is there a pain point or something that's not being resolved for their customer base or users who are looking at their product? And we found it. For us, it was the add-on business model. People wanted to be able to just get a piece of something and not have to buy a whole, you know, the whole developer bundle. They just wanted this one piece of functionality. So some, one way you can do this is just find out what's selling. There's lots of 
big spaces that are available right now. Uh, learning management systems are a big space. Membership plugins are a huge space. And there are problems that are not yet being solved in those spaces. So there's plenty of room for people to come in there and say, I can solve this problem. The second challenge you may want to deal with uh, in that first stage, getting to 10,000, is getting your product known, used, and loved. And this is extremely challenging. When we started out, we were unknowns. We were new to the WordPress community. Nobody knew who we were. We felt relatively invisible. In fact, when some people did find out about our product, they just told us, don't bother. Like, there's no reason for it. There's plenty of other solutions. We don't know who you are. What's the point? Uh, luckily, I'm stubborn, and when somebody tells me I can't do something, I, am, I have to challenge that and say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it happen anyway. So we pressed through. Uh, but you want to get your product known. There's a lot of ways that you can do that, and I'm going to give you some, some really basic ones. Uh, and to me, these are the most effective things because what, building your product and getting your product known actually starts, and if you saw Chris Lemma's talk earlier, starts before you release the product. It starts by building anticipation. It starts by talking it up. It starts by uh, letting people know what's coming. Another thing that I think is super important, uh, just I think, from an, I think from a good community standpoint, is learn to be a cheerleader. One of the first things that we do as a business is we sit around, we coach our team, and we talk to each other. I tell my team at every stage, we don't criticize. We don't point fingers. We don't, we're not, that's not our business. Our business is to cheerlead. When you see, a, whether it be a competitor, another business, a person doing something great or celebrating something, cheer them on. Celebrate that with them. Put it out on Twitter. Write a blog post about it. Do anything you can to let people know uh, that we're proud of them and that we're excited for the conquests and the things that they are achieving. Uh, this is huge. And yes, there is a little bit of a self-serving purpose to this. On one level, it just creates goodwill, right? We all... All of a sudden, people like you, you like them, and it creates a good uh, environment. But the other thing is, is then when you go to do something, and you go to release a product, or you go to release something new, they're going to talk about you because you've made a friend. You've established yourself as somebody who is positive and is giving them positive energy. They're going to give you positive energy. So I encourage you to be a cheerleader. Uh, the other thing you can do is, and this is a lot, of, a lot of times we don't like this, you can do like an affiliate program. Oh, I went too far. I think I deleted that slide. You can do an affiliate program. A lot of us hate affiliates, let's be honest. We hate the idea of somebody promoting our product because uh, there is some sort of self-serving, I'm making money, and it feels slimy, and like the hard sale, and a used car salesman maybe kind of idea. Uh, I, the truth is, here's my opinion on affiliates. I don't care why somebody comes to my site or my product and purchases it if I believe in it. I believe in the product. I don't really care how they got there. I'm going to convince them that they made the right choice, no matter how slimy an affiliate might have been. Um, now, we try to police our affiliates, and I encourage you to find affiliates who believe in your product, who use your product. Those are the best kinds of affiliates. Uh, but to be honest, if someone slips through the, tra slips through the cracks and just starts uh, you know, blitzing your product and promoting it, and you're making sales, who, who cares? Like, who cares how they got there? Just continue to do what you're doing. And all this stuff is to get you up to the point where you're just getting a little bit of money and revenue flowing. You're not making money. You're not quitting your job, most likely. You're probably still working on the side. You're doing something. So now we have the next stage, right? The next stage is the, how do we get to $150,000? You know, that pile of cash starts to get a little bit bigger. And how do, we, how do we start bringing that in? Now, it's funny because I was having a conversation with somebody at my table, and I said, said what my talk was about. I'm talking about getting to your first million in revenue. And they're like, oh, wow, have you done that? Well, I'm not going to give a talk on something I haven't done. I was like, yeah. And they go, awesome. What product? The one I'm standing at the booth at. <laughs> like, because <laughs> it's the only one who can afford it. Like, that's, you know. But here's the thing. When you say something like that, when you say, hey, I'm going to talk about how to get to your, you know, your first million in revenue, you think, like, I made a million last week, and I've got cash, like, in a briefcase under the table that I can prove to you I've made a million dollars. And it doesn't work like that, right? Because all that money gets spent on other things or other challenges. So let's talk about the next challenge, right? If you want to go from 10000 to $150,000, and for us, that was right around 2100 customers for us. Uh, the next thing you want to start thinking about is your business model. Now, this is how we went through the process. You may have to figure these things out at different stages. This is just more of a, a, a story through what we had to do. And the business model was important for us. It's actually what spearheaded our growth. 
Our, in 2011, in six months, we did a few thousand dollars. In all of 2012, we did $10,000. And when we launched the add-on model in 2013, our sales skyrocketed. Essentially, we raised our price by 300, 400% if you were to buy the add-ons individually, and we just started making money. It was really weird. Like, we charged more. We didn't lose customers. We just made more money. It worked out really well for us. Uh, so the add-on model was really important to us. So you want to choose a business model that works for you, and not every business model works for every single product. I was lucky enough that the add-on model worked for a form-building plugin, but that doesn't mean it works for every single plugin. Uh, there are lots of people who are in the add-on model who are regretting the decision of ever getting into the add-on model business. Like, it's not all roses and unicorns. It's, it's, it's tough. There's a lot of challenges in the add-on business model. But there are a lot of ad business models you can choose from. So here's just a few of the business models that exist uh, that you're probably familiar with, right? You have paid products, and there's some, some familiar products there. You have Gravity Forms, Affiliate WP, Backup Buddy. You just you go to their site, you buy their product. There's no free version. You just you, you spend some money and you get a good product. Uh, then you move on. There's the freemium model. Lots of uh, Soliloquy WP has a light version. Then you can upgrade to a pro version. iTheme Security, um, Event Calendar to Event Calendar Pro. Right there are these upgrades. You also have the SaaS space. So OptinMonster, Vault Press, uh, iTheme Sync. These are the SaaS services. And then, of course, the add-on model. When we came into the add-on model, it was pretty much just e-commerce solutions. That's the only ones who were doing it. And so we thought, I think this works, and we tried it. And now there's membership plugins, there's social media plugins, there's all kinds of new plugins that are now exploring the add-on model as a solution. Now, I am an advocate for the add-on model. Don't get me wrong. I, like I say, it's not meant for everybody, but I'm a big fan of it, and I'm a big fan of it for one major reason. Seth Godin has a great quote where he says, the goal in business is not to find more customers for your product, but to find more products for your customers. And we see this done really well in Apple, right? Is there, are there any Apple like fans here? MacBook, right? Do you have an iPhone? If you have a MacBook, do you have an iPhone too? Yeah? Do you, maybe an iPad? Anybody, iPad, right? Anybody, Apple Watch, anybody, a few people, right? Apple's great at this. They just keep making more products for their current customers. They don't need to acquire a whole lot of new customers because we are going to buy every piece of crap they put out no matter what. Like, we are sold. We just assume whatever they put out is going to be the next big thing. So we're excited about that. So the, the best thing you can do, right, is create products for your customers. You don't have to acquire new ones, and you can still continue to grow your business and make additional money. The other challenge you have is setting your prices. And this is a really tough one for businesses because we all, like, when we came into the market, you know, like I said, there was Gravity Forms, there was a big product there, and we decided we were going to try to compete on price. Like, we had, we had not, not complete feature parity between the two of us, but we had a lot of what they offered. So we started selling our plug-in for $15. Um, and, and at that time, it was an unlimited license, unlimited updates, unlimited support. And this was years ago, although we still should have known better. Uh, and then after a while, what we did is we switched and we tried out a freemium model. So we offered a light version and then we upgraded to a pro version. And that didn't see any change. And then we switched to the add-on model. So kind of backtracking as we're thinking through price, right? Both price and business model, these are not, these do not have to be terminal. When you create a, set up your business, set up your product, and you create a business model, you don't have to change, you can change it, you don't have to stay that way. You can adjust, you can experiment, and matter of fact, you must experiment. I say do that in the early stages, in the 10,000 to 150,000, because once you get into, you know, 6,000, 10,000, 15,000 customers, it becomes a lot harder to, to kind of transition and pivot. So you can experiment a little bit. Uh, if you want to think about pain points, think about when WooThemes changed their pricing structure. Uh, not just a few years ago, right? And it was a big hullabaloo. Like, there was lots of people that were really upset. Uh, but they had to do it because it was smart for their business. If they were going to continue to sustain and grow and continue to do what they were doing, they had to make adjustments. So be willing to experiment and try different things out. It's totally okay. Uh, like I said, we went through four business models before we ended up on the add-on business model, which worked out really well. But when you're setting your prices, there's a lot of things that you also have to consider, all right? 
there's a lot of factors that you're going to deal with with your prices. And some of the ones that you already think about, right, is development. So you're thinking about, all right, how much time have I put into this product? How, how much am I developing this product? How much, all of that, that, that kind of stuff. Support, like how much support am I, is this product going to require? Is this a very easy product for customers to get? Or am I going to be doing a little more hand-holding and kind of white glove service with that? The other one is functionality. What, am I, what value am I giving to the customer? I can charge more for something that adds more value, obviously. But those aren't the only things that matter. Because if you're selling a product, you have the tools that you pay for, right? You have software, you have your e-commerce store, you have whatever. You have administration costs, you have hosting, you have bandwidth, you have payroll, possibly, as you grow. Marketing expense. All that money comes from your product sales. Like, that's where it comes from. So when you're thinking about your prices, when you're, want, when you're thinking about, I'm going to sell that next $39 plug-in, you have to ask yourself, is that $39 going to pay all of this stuff? How many customers do I need to get? How many renewals do I need to have each year for me to afford all the stuff I need to run my business? Because it's not just all how much time did you invest in it on the front end. It's not even all how much time does it spend you to support it. There are a lot of other factors that you're dealing with. And these are just some of the simple things to kind of get you to that stage of 150K. Let's talk about how do you get to 500 million? What are the challenges that you're going to work through and walk through to get to 500K? Supporting your users is tough. It is the expense that continues to grow month after month, year after year, and it doesn't matter what you do, it's just going to get bigger the larger your user and your customer base gets. Now there's some things that you can do, there's some tips I have for you, right? And you've probably heard some of these before, never answer the same question twice. So if somebody asks you a question and you can anticipate this question is going to be answered again, asked again, write a document, get it somewhere available. Uh, for you and so that they you can kind of point them at least at the very least if you they ask for support You're not spending a whole time rewriting your answer to them. You just point them to a document that explains their issue um, Some of you are still some of you have still used forums uh, Open forums so people can search that information get rid of them. I Don't don't even keep the archives. Don't save them. Don't do anything get yourself into a support system like help scout or Zendesk or desk or any of those systems, because what's going to end up happening is your users are going to go into that forum and they're going to look at something from two years ago that's been fixed in a different way or it isn't even their problem anymore, and they're just going to screw it up even further because it sounds like their issue. Uh, the, the, the percentage of people who actually look for the answer for themselves is so minute, it's not worth keeping it going and the, the administrative headache it is to keep that thing running. I'd much rather have a ticket come into my support queue and have my support team be able to answer that in just a few seconds by pointing them to a documentation than have them look for an answer, find the wrong one, try it out, look for another answer, try it out, and then two weeks later come to us extremely frustrated saying your product doesn't work, what's going on, when we knew exactly what they needed. That's why we have a support team, that's why they're the experts, they can hear the problem and they can point the person exactly where they need to be. There are other problems that you're going to deal with with supporting users, though, that we don't like to say, and it sounds, it sounds tough, and I, I say this with all due respect. Just remember when I, what I'm about to say. I said with all due respect. Um, everybody lies. Every single person, every single one of us lies. We don't always do it maliciously. It's not always intentional. It's sometimes we just missed it. We didn't catch it. We, but if you ever, if you, you already experienced it, right? You ask a, a customer or a user, hey, all you need to do is this. Did you try that? And they come back, yeah, yeah, I tried that. And then you say, oh, well, give me admin credentials. I'll take a look. And you log into their site, and you do the thing you told them to do, and it fixes it. And they're like, oh, I tried that. Nah, you didn't, because if you had tried it, it worked, and you lied to me. You thought you tried it, and that's the thing you have to temper it with, right? You thought they tried it. They thought they tried it, but they didn't. The other problem is, is users don't read because they're in a hurry. They want to solve a problem. They want to get to the solution, and so they don't have time to read a 12-page document on how to do this thing. So make it as easy and as succinct as possible. Three to four bullet lists. Do this, do this, do this, done. Don't write, you're not writing prose. This isn't poetry. Your documentation is not going to be published someday, and people are going to be like, they wrote the most beautiful and elegant, you know, documentation ever. This will be read for years to come to demonstrate how good poetry should be written. Like, that's not going to happen, so keep it as simple as possible. 
Uh, and, just, and just remember that, that you're, that's just something you're going to have to deal with. Customers lie, customers don't read. Uh, and the other problem you're going to deal with is, unfortunately, in, in human nature, is we're all negative by nature. You are, your customers are more likely to be angry than they are to be ecstatic. And it's not because they don't love you or love your product or think you've done good things. It's just when they're in the midst of trying to solve a problem and something doesn't work, we all get frustrated. All of us, our, our blood begins to boil because we don't know why this thing isn't working. And so they're more likely to, to, to kind of attack you and be extremely aggressive. And the worst thing you can do is to come right back and say, whoa, 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 slow it down. Like, there's no reason for you to yell at me. Just be polite. Be nice, solve their problem, and you will, you'll do great. The other challenge you have as you start to get into this level of customer, you know, this level of users or customers, is growing your team. This is tough, right, because you have to decide when's the right time to start adding team members to your business. When's the right time to add that new support person or that new developer? And, and to be honest, in, our, in the WordPress space, it, it seems to me, we always just hire developers. Because that seems like that's the only need, and so we're like, oh, I'm going to hire another developer, I'm going to hire another developer, and I'm going to hire a developer to do support, and then I'm going to hire a developer to, to write content, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hire a developer to do this. And you have other needs in your business. So our first person we hired was a support person. He knew nothing about tech. He, knew not how, he did, couldn't write a line of code. He didn't know any of that. He didn't even know WordPress. He was an Amazon warehouse support lead. That's what he did. He knew how to support people in high stress situations, and he just dealt with that. Because in my, in, in, in my experience, when I'm dealing with support, I want good support people. I want people with good communication skills. I want people who know how to diffuse a situation. I can teach them the product. I can teach them WordPress. I can teach them all of that stuff, but you can't teach people always how to deal with people properly. So be careful when you're hiring what you're hiring for. A perfect example is our most recent hire was a content writer. We didn't hire anybody who knew WordPress. We didn't hire anybody who knew uh, how to write code or how to explain WordPress terminology. We hired a high school biology teacher. Because that high school biology teacher knows how to take complex concepts, didn't matter what the concept is, and bring it down and make it simple to understand and digest. That's what I want when I write tutorials. That's what I want when we write content. I want somebody who can take something that's seemingly very difficult and bring it down to a lower level and explain it to users who may not have that same experience. Uh, I would say for, you know, as, a, as to when do you grow your team, when do you make your first hire, when do you do that, that's going to depend on your particular product. It's going to depend on your particular support load and all those things. Um, but I would say when you start finding yourself chasing fires, I'm trying to, I'm, I have to fix this bug, I have to answer this support ticket, I have to deal with this thing, and you don't have time to do anything else but work in your business, like you're just, you're working in it all the time, and that's all you're doing, and you can't find any way to get your head above water to see the bigger picture and to think about what's next, what's coming down a year down the road, you might be at that place where you have to figure out what is your biggest need, is it support, is it development, is it marketing, what is it, figure that out and start finding that position. So let's talk about the big number, getting to 1 million. So for us, that's getting to about uh, 1,100, 12, uh, 11,000, 12,000 customers. How do we get to 1 million? What are the challenges that we have to face? Once you start getting into numbers like this, um, and this isn't obviously, this isn't necessarily annual revenue, but once you start getting into numbers like this, one of the challenges you have to deal with is getting professional assistance. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, a shrink or a psychologist, although some of you may very well need that kind of professional assistance. <laughs> um, I know I would like that kind of professional assistance at times, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you need to start thinking about the legal side of your business a lot more uh, aggressively. You need to start thinking about the financial side of your business. And making those wrong decisions and hiring the wrong people who do not understand your industry, your business, your dynamic, the things that your state needs, your city needs, your county needs. Uh, can hurt you. To give you an example, I have two really important ones. Uh, a year ago, I was going to a kind of a, a kind of a code and a, kind of a lunch and code session in our hometown, and uh, I show up there and I get out of the car and I get this call from my bookkeeper at the time saying, "Hey, do you know anything about franchise excise tax?" I'm like, "No, that's why I hired you." 
I, so tell me about it. She says, well, I was doing the, the books, and it looks like uh, you don't, I, don't, I can't find a number. I said, I didn't know I needed a number. You did, I didn't know. She says, and it looks like it's going to be about $15,000, and it was due a month ago. I'm like, what? Like, that was crazy. Now, if you know anything about franchise excise tax, you know it's probably not that high, but she didn't know what she was doing. And so I got a little bit of some palpitations at the moment, thinking, we're, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't just have 15 grand sitting around to just drop, because it's earmarked for something else. Any money I have in my account has a purpose. It's doing something. And it wasn't just sitting there to, for some rainy day occasion where somebody hits me with a tax bill that I didn't know about. But that wasn't the first instance where I hit that. It turns out that was, it was like $150, and that was no big deal, and we took care of it, and not a big problem. The other big problem, though, is uh, when I got my Schedule K for 2014, my bookkeeper was doing, my, doing our taxes, and there's this little box that you have to check that says whether or not you are uh, required to pay self-employment tax. Because in our company, we're an LLC, so it means our part, you know, me and my partner, we, don't, we can't be a W-2 staffed employee. We just have to take off the profit we take draws out of, the, out of the business. But there's a box that you have to check because there's two types of partners. There's an active partner and an inactive partner. So you could be a partner that says, you know, I'm a 50% partner, but I don't work in the business. And so I'm not required to pay self-employment tax. By the way, none of this is accounting advice. I'm just telling a story of what happened to me. <laughs> I feel like I just need to say that. Uh, so anyway, I was, <laughs> I did, so, you know, I, you don't have to pay it if you're not an active partner. But if you are an active partner, meaning you, you contribute to the revenue growth of your business, then you have to pay self-employment tax. You have to check that box. You have to pay it. Well, when my bookkeeping was done for me in 2014, that box didn't get checked. And it came at a tax bill for me this year that I have to find of $26,000. Yeah, it hurts. Like, you know, I'm not going to lie. I'm not, wasn't excited about it. We'll figure it out, but it wasn't great, right? You want to get proper people who know what they're doing. You want people who understand your industry. When I got my newest account, so we fired her and we hired a new accountant, and this guy was great. He came into my office, and he said, here's exactly all the things you're on the hook for, and this is the stuff we're going to do for you, and this is what I'm going to need to make that happen, and all this stuff. It was awesome. So I encourage you, get good help. I mean, you're at some point, you, you, and probably earlier than this stage, if your product is taking off, you want to protect that intellectual property. You want to protect your trademark. So you need to file paperwork for that. Make sure you under, get to somebody who know, understands trademark law, knows how to file that stuff, because you could find yourself spinning your wheels over and over again, because it's not like it's a cut and dry, just do this. It's, a, it's, a, it's an involved process. And having somebody who will help with that is huge. And the last thing I want to talk about when we start to get into this size is remaining agile. It's at this point where we start to kind of really struggle when we start growing. Our user base grows. NinjaForms now has somewhere, uh, because of stats not given to us by WordPress.org, um, somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 active installs. We have somewhere in the vicinity of 16 to 17,000 customers. Uh, I'll take it. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. I appreciate that. that. That was very kind and un completely unexpected. Um, uh, but here's the thing. When your product gets that big and it's on that many installs, you can't just turn on a dime. You can't just make a quick change. You have to think very meticulously about every little thing that you do. When you're young and you're just coming into the, a product space, you're super agile. You can, you can turn on a dime. You can make all these really cool things and do it really, really fast. Uh, I don't think he's here, but I was talking to Josh Pollock. Josh Pollock has Caldera WP, and he has a, a plugin called Caldera Forms. He is essentially a competing product to our own. He's a great guy. I told him, I called him a competitor, and he's like, yeah, I wish I could be called your competitor. I'm like, no, no, you are. I recognize that, and I'm not naive enough not to recognize it. Here's why. He's scrappy. He writes good code. He writes he puts things out very, very fast. He writes great content. He's a brilliant guy. He's good, right? And he can do things that I can't do with Ninja Forms because he can turn very quickly. His user base can adjust. It's not a big deal. I can't do that. So that's really important. Agility is part. So we're launching three. So you've heard a talk. Chris Lemma mentioned it. If you came by our table, we showed you Ninja Forms 3. That's a big deal. So we have all kinds of things that we have to think about, like roll, being able to roll back easily. How do we do slow rollout so not everybody's getting bombarded? What does this mean to our support team? There's a lot of stuff that we have to consider. So 
As you get bigger, one of your challenges is figuring out how do we stay agile? How do we make sure that our code base is, is set up in such a way that we can easily transition if we need to? If we need to pull something out, put something in, how do we make that as extensible as possible? You have to think about your team and your payroll. If something happens to our finances, if we dip, do we have the ability to be agile and just kind of pivot and do something else to increase revenue? Or do we, were we smart enough in our hiring where if a dip happens, we don't wonder how are we making payroll? These are things you want to be you want to consider, and, and, and being agile is super super important, and it's a super super big challenge as you get to that higher stage of 13,000, 14, 16, 7,000, and God forbid a million installs or something like that. I don't even want to think about it. Like it's a challenging process. So, uh, yeah. So that's the last challenge I wanted to talk to, and I'll open it up for questions. So the, so the question is, if you're getting started, which we did talk about a little bit, but there's some stuff that we can mention about that, right? If you're getting started, do you sell in a marketplace or do you just go out on your own? And it really, it, it really kind of depends on how much risk you're willing to take in that, those early stages. Going out on your own and not having ready traffic is difficult at times. So when we put up our website, nobody knew who we were. Getting people to come to our site was tough. That's why the freemium model works really well because you have all these .org users who might discover your product and then come to you. But if it's a paid only product, that can be difficult. Uh, marketplaces are great. So m some of you have heard of Pippin Williamson of EDD, uh, of EDD and stuff like that. He got his place started in Code Canyon. That's where he released his first few products and saw a lot of success. And it's what uh, kind of urged him on to keep doing it. So he started to see that success and he moved. So it really just depends on the product, the amount of risk you want to take, how much you work you want to put into that initial stage of marketing. <laughs> so... Yeah, so f what, what is the question is, uh, like, what's, what is my take or my thoughts on free versus priority support? Well, so we offer priority support, obviously, for all of our products because they're paid products and customers deserve priority support. Uh, but we also try to give next to priority support for all of our free users. If you are a, if you, especially if it's a freemium plugin. Now, if it's just a free plugin, let's, let's differentiate. If you just have a free plugin, I don't think you need to offer priority support. You offer what support you can, and you, you know what I mean? It's a free product. There's no, there's no entitlement there. As a freemium product, you have to be very careful when you make the distinction, I'm not going to offer free support because I can't afford it. You have to kind of juggle that a little bit, because here's the thing. They don't care. Users don't care whether or not it's free or not free. Th that is, one, it's a, it's a marketing step. So people who use your free product, if they don't get good support when they're using your free product, then they're never going to give you any money. Because why would they give you money if they've had a terrible support experience? Uh, they are more likely to leave one-star reviews in the .org, and you'll see those occasionally when you don't pro provide the support they think they're entitled to. So it's, 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 a, it's a kid glove kind of situation that you have to kind of decide what you're willing to, willing to do. I think at a certain point, at a certain scale, you get to the point where you have to say, I can't afford to support 95% you know, of my user base that's free at the expense of my 5% who is paying me money. So I think you would kind of have to kind of juggle that a little bit. I think free support is important, though, if you have a freemium product or an add-on model like that. Yeah, so for us, support started with just me and my partner. We handled all the support, and I built with Ninja Forms a support solution. Uh, then it, it got to the point where we realized I didn't want to have to maintain that support solution over time, so we switched to uh, a solution like Help Scout, and we were using Help Scout for a long time. But Help Scout doesn't have priority, and if you're doing customer support and free support, priority is huge because you want to be able to take those customers and drop, put them at the top of the list, make sure they're taken care of. Uh, we also have third-party collaborating developers who are also in our support system, and so they need to have access to the system, to the tickets that pertain to them. Uh, so we went through a challenge. For us, hiring, like we, 
we hired our first person, which was the Amazon uh, guy, and then after that, we turned around and hired somebody from Apple uh, who did support for Apple, and then we turned around and hired another guy who worked for our local university IT. So none of our support team were, were specialists or tech, technical specialists. Yeah, that's tough, right? So in my opinion, in the add-on model or freemium model, the free product has to be top-notch. It has to be a full product. You cannot dumb it down too much. You don't create artificial limitations. But then you have to say, what do we sell? And sometimes what that means is you're going to sell things that 80% of your users want. So for instance, for us, layout and styles, people are like, well, it's such an easy thing. I want to be able to style my form. And I'm like, yeah, we know. That's why we sell it, because that's why we make money. <laughs> so uh, also, you have to think about things like what costs you support. So that determines what you sell. Uh, file uploads because of server issues and stuff like that. And that, so we charge for that. Uh, but really, you just kind of have to listen to your user base with your free product, find out what they're looking for, and that's how you can determine some of the features that you can build as add-ons on top of your platform. Um, that would be the big way. I think we're uh, pretty much done. We got one minute, and I think I, I will talk more than one minute if I, I get another question. So with that, thank you so much. I appreciate it.